Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with Russell Carpenter, the cinematographer for Avatar, The Way of Water. And, um, you know, many of the creatives on this film were a part of the production on the first Avatar film, uh, but you were not the cinematographer for that movie. So I I'm wondering what it, what was it like? How did you approach jumping into this world that already had kind of a pre-established visual language? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, the first mandate for me thinking is I, I want to uh, achieve the level and the quality of what uh, Mauro Fiore did. And then fairly quickly after that, it was, I, I want to survive this production because they were just, <laughs> Jim, I, I, somebody said in an article, Jim is the grand provocateur. And what he'll do with his people, I mean, I mean, one of the team is he'll just lay a challenge at your feet and mm -hmm. say, uh, go figure this out with your people, you know, and get, you know, I, I just, I just need this done. And I need, and so we all run off and we, we, you know, we, we try to make that happen. Um, let's see here. I am just going to plug this in my, realize I was not on my battery. Sorry. That's Sorry, okay. podcast viewers. Okay. Um, uh, so our hearers, um, so jumping into this, it was very, very different from any experience I'd had with Jim because, uh, I was moving into a virtual, uh, a world of virtual, uh, creation and that was brand mm -hmm. new. And yet I was tasked with doing the same things I would probably do on a set. Uh, and, uh, so I came in one whole year ahead of rolling live action. But during that time, uh, besides prepping the film, I, uh, I did virtual lighting. And so I had to learn how to ride that bike. And, uh, you know, it turned out to be much more pleasant than I ever thought it would be. I, I learned that I could probably do everything I could on a set and then some. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> things you wished you had on a set, like the incredible invisible light, which you'd like to put, <laughs> you want to put right here, but it's, unfortunately, it's, it, we're going to, on a live set, we'd be shooting that. And, and, but uh, on a virtual set, you just flip a switch and it just goes away. That's lovely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, but in terms of, okay, so the language is totally different. The environment, working environment was like, say, totally different than Titanic and the language, mm -hmm. uh, uh, stepping into it, you know, you, there, there's an established language of what Pandora is. And uh, as somebody's doing the lighting, you have to, you just honor that, you know, and there are, um, s some, what I would say is, is, you know, Jim and I talked about this. He, he had certain basics that that you you'd use if you were lighting a Pandoran forest you know and mm -hmm. he didn't want it to be a white light world he wanted the he wanted the light to fracture somewhat so so the light that's coming through the trees that's hitting a person is one color and yet this beautiful blue green that happens in the shade under the canopy that's another color and then he wanted to emphasize the fact that when sunlight hits plants it, it say it could bounce up in a beautiful way and if a, a, a navi character was there or running by it you'd you'd really sense that and and it was a a, a world he wanted that that navi and people you know especially we have a human character uh felt connected aesthetically with that world you know as uh, when i looked at what he was doing it it you know it felt to me I said oh where, I, gosh I've seen this in the work of a, a the Hudson River School uh, which is in the mid 1800s and in that and then their landscapes were fantastic in terms of how they used light and it, I mean it was awe inspiring and and I I could connect with that in what what I had seen in the concept art and what I was tasked to do in um, in the way of water. Uh, also, you know, I lit a lot of sets in the Marui, and I always wanted to, you feel to 
the, the light coming in, you feel a connection always, even if the, you're in the, the Marui is open or it has this, maybe has this beautiful sapphire or turquoise window. And you always wanted to feel the light coming in and, and, and that there was a connection with this outside world. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I looked for that a lot. And then say in another scene, say the, the scene after the raid at the beginning of the film where, where the raid party returns to their hiding place, which is they call high camp, or at least we were calling it high camp. And you have this strange mixture of, I mean, you have light coming up from kind of this, they're, they're enclosed, but light comes in and comes up from the, this canyon. It's really beautiful. And then you have, uh, as the, the, the scene changes into night, you have these beautiful, warm sources that you would as associate with the Navi, but also in the high camp, because you have kind of the what we call the friendly recoms have set up a base there. You also have a sense of the, the blue light that comes off of, of those. They have these lights, yeah. you know, I don't know if you saw them, but they're kind of spread all over. So here's this kind of hybrid culture working there. And I wanted to pay attention to that when, uh, mm. uh, when lighting. One of my favorite things about it, I think you talked about the world a bit and the cinematography kind of helps create this really immersive quality to the film where you as an audience member feel dropped into the world and I like I specifically think of scenes where they're maybe riding their banshees uh, or, or the water versions of them and you're right there on their shoulder and kind of like moving with them is that what what was the process behind creating that was that just the magic well, of virtual cinematography uh, uh, even though I got there a year before we started shooting a lot of work had been done I mean this mm. uh, th it's a layer cake where they, <laughs> you know after the script uh, you have to create that world uh, design that world and then after uh, that, Jim virtually has to scout that world and make changes, you know. Uh, uh, and then after that, uh, he works with his troupe, uh, this really gifted group of people that basically he blocks the scenes with them and he and then basically edits those scenes. And then, then it's time to bring the actors in and there, all these performances are captured. And I think you'll notice that the technology just just basically capturing the landscape of the human face, which becomes a Navi face. Uh, there have been some big changes in that, mm -hmm. and I think it, you know, people really see that. The um, you know one the, these landscapes are amazing, but the way Jim works and he. He, I see him work on these things, and you know, I would see him work on these things, and he's just painstaking. I mean, he he works and works and works and works until he's maybe got, you know, maybe just the most beautiful flight path, and and uh, you know, and that takes a long time. I mean, I mean, you, you could just film. Okay, here are some people flying along, but he makes the audience work a little. Not not only in the 3D mm -hmm. process, but uh, you notice he's constantly revealing, and that's what's that's the beauty that I think it, he, in these shots. I mean, you start here, and then and then the shot, his his camera kind of lets the shot unscroll basically. Yeah, and so I I think it's part of the genius of Jim's immersive process. Not not only you know the you know what what he's immersing you in but the fact that he's having the audience do some work as that camera angle changes more and more is revealed and now more is revealed you know it's it's pretty rare that you you just see hey here's a shot you don't it, no here's a tableau is is where he goes with it you know and mm -hmm. that's constantly changing and and um you know, yeah, they're they're beautiful shots, and all I can say is having watched him work, I, I mean, it's like you think this guy's really smart. This must be pretty easy for him. It wasn't that. I just watched him work these shots and work these shots and work these shots till he had something 
that he, he wanted people to see. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was this this was a, a long process. Yeah, it uh, sounds <laughs> sounds very painstaking. Um, and as the title you know suggests, there are many underwater sequences. Whether it's a very awe inspiring uh, shot of the Tulkun, or or it's within a sinking ship going through those bowels of the ship. What is the most difficult part of shooting an underwater sequence? Well, um, well, well, the help there is that everything's been pre-visualized. And, uh, and so, and then it gets, you go through this process called tech viz. And then you know, basically where the camera has to go. And we, then we have, the creative part for us starts to become, how are we gonna realize this shot? Underwater is pretty much the same as it was with Titanic, which is <laughs> a massive headache. You know? well, at least you have the experience with it. Yeah, I have the experience except <laughs> that uh, Rose and Jack weren't wearing masks, uh, which Spider was. And as soon as you put a mask on somebody, you see every light, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. you see the lighting over in craft service. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, it's just that happens. And now, you, now, now you've, now you've got a problem on your hands. We, we actually tested that mask that he was wearing over and over again and made some modifications and it made it a little bit easier to, to light, but uh, it was working underwater is still uh like it was on Titanic, it's it, it's very slow going, you know. Even though, luckily, we have different technology, different lighting technology that's easy to handle. Yeah, I literally, you can take take your light, your waterproof fluorescent, put it where you want it to, and then it's has this battery in it, and it's all remotely controlled, and it you can make any color out of it. That was that was one thing, and yet still, it managed to sometimes takes so long uh, you know when you know every once in a while you have a i wish i'd never been born day and uh <laughs> and, and those those usually happen when we were working in the tanks you know just because of you know it's complex but what can I'm i sure. say? yeah <laughs> well we're glad you were born because it, it turned out very well i think the effort oh, was worth it uh, right. yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I feel a lot better having seen, you know, the picture <laughs> than, than actually slogging through a day in the tank. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, but it's this film, I think, you know, you're no stranger to a, a big blockbuster, as you said, with Titanic and much of your your history is with these really epic scale movies. And I mean, this one, that final battle sequence, I, yeah. I it's one of the biggest uh action set pieces of the year i would say and um i'm curious what is it about that kind of large scale work these blockbusters that speaks to you and draws you in uh boy you know i see that scene and, and it goes you know it's it's fairly long but it goes by really fast yeah and there is a ton happening usually the problems are the, the same i had in the in the forest uh, which is uh well not quite the same but at a certain point i get tasked with you know a, a lot of percentage of the day going to working with spider or working with a spider who actually is is growing pretty fast so you know you're on the clock covid didn't help because it stopped filming for for a while i mean, was filming for more months than you could imagine and uh, coming back to that, it, the problems are still the same. I, eventually, I'm just tasked with, I've got to merge every human character in the film seamlessly. Because if you don't, if you don't get the lighting right, there, there are little things, you know, if you get them wrong, it somehow triggers the audience and takes them out of the film for a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. every you know, everybody knows what daylight looks like. Everybody look kind of knows what walking around in a forest looks like, or you know, being a being around a campfire looks like. You you just you know, l luckily we had our systems, our lighting systems that 
collected all our information and years later we could look at it that hey what did we do in the lighting and you have that to match with eventually it all, but it all comes down to uh you know your your instincts we had its marvelous program called simulcam which in real time com composites the virtual the virtual environment that was shot two three years ago with the human character that you're shooting in such a way it composites it so um in a, in a way that embeds the character in the environment without all the things that you usually see when you're trying to do you know you you've heard oh we're gonna we're gonna do half the composite and we're gonna fade it into i mean we're gonna fade it halfway into the real and then you're kind of looking at something that's not this or that and you're trying to figure out what you're doing well this system was incredible and it uh it really gave me a look at, hey, th this is really working. You know, that's that's mm -hmm. the main thing. And uh, so, again, something they just didn't have on uh, the first one. So I, I feel like I, I got a mighty leg up, you know. Yeah. On, but but you also notice that there's a lot more close interaction between human characters and, and Navi in this film. Absolutely. Well, then quickly, before I let you go, um, before we have to wrap up, is there one shot that really, you know, is a, a favorite shot of yours that made it in where you think, oh, God, thank God that all worked out and all the lighting came together? I, you, not one shot. It's just the sequences of of Spider running along with the Navis and they're mm -hmm. running, over, running for long distances over hilly terrain. And it's, you know, a lot a lot goes into that. I mean, from every department, and uh, I am glad that seems seamless to me. And I, I uh, uh, that's kind of the type of thing that I hope doesn't jump out to anybody. I mean, I I, I, I do want to become the the silent partner in in all of that, and. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the things I'm happiest with. Well, I hope you're happy with the whole thing. Thank you for spending all that time in the tank because it yeah. all came together really well. So okay. congratulations, great work on this film. For everyone who's out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep with us the rest of the season. Russell, it was great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.